Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for coming tonight. It's my absolute pleasure to be chairing this event. My name's Alice Roberts. Um, I'm an anatomist from Bristol University, but um, I'm joined tonight by um, two very eminent people from the world of um, fiction and science uh, to talk about fossils. Um, just before I introduce them properly, can I ask that everybody has switched off their mobile phones? It's very important. Um, we'll think of some suitable punishment if uh, we'll, be, we'll be throwing bits of fossil vertebrae at you if, you, <laughs> if they go off here. Yeah. Oh, have you? Um, the, the event is going to be webcast and recorded. We are going to be um, in conversation and then opening to questions. So we'll kind of assume that if you're asking a question, you're quite happy to be recorded. That's, a, that's the sort of contract that we enter into there. Um, and I can now go on to introduce uh, our two speakers. Tracy Chevalier, here on my left, was born in 1962 and grew up in the States. She studied English at Oberlin College, Ohio, and completed her MA in creative writing at the University of East Anglia. And while she was studying, she began her first novel, The Virgin Blue, which was published by HarperCollins in 97. She's probably best known as the author of the hugely successful Girl with a Pearl Earring, which was published in 1999, and it blends historical fact with imagination, something we'll be looking at in a lot more detail tonight. Her meticulously researched novels have transported us into historical contexts as diverse as the superstitions and religious conflicts of 16th century rural France with the Virgin Blue, early Edwardian London, a time of great social ferment in England just after the death of Queen Victoria, uh, with Falling Angels, which she published just after the millennium, and the tapestry workshops of Paris and Brussels during the last decade of the 1400s in The Lady and the Unicorn. But it's her new book that we're really um, focusing on tonight, Remarkable Creatures, uh, which, is, which has just been published by HarperCollins. And it's about Mary Anning, the 19th century fossil collector. She discovered very early uh, pre-dinosaur fossils, such as ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, um, on uh, the beaches of Lyme Regis, uh, which is, as you probably know, on the southern coast of England. Mary lived all her life in poverty, having sold her extraordinary findings to eminent male geologists who wrote about them and uh, reaped perhaps a lot of the glory which, which perhaps um, should have been hers. Tracy's particularly interested in how the results of Mary's findings eventually paved the way for the really momentous changes in scientific thinking uh, during the 19th century um, and, of course, uh, the development of the theory of evolution. Richard Forty, on my right, studied geolo geology at the University of Cambridge and is currently a paleontologist at the Natural History Museum. Richard's interests include, above all, trilobites, or trilobite with an exclamation mark on the end. <laughs> he found his first one when he was 14, and the interest later turned into a career. He's named numerous species and still continues his, respe his research despite having retired from the museum. It was, it was still to be seen in there, I think, in the hallowed halls. He studies trilobites and graptolites, especially from the Ordovician, and he's also involved in wider research um, around the sort of the environments that those animals lived in, um, the general sort of uh, evolution of arthropods um, and the origin of major groups, and also the relationship between what the fossil record can tell us about these ancient creatures and what um, genetics can tell us about them as well. It's two very sort of initially uh, apparently very disparate uh, branches of science coming together there. He's won many accolades for his writing. In 93, his book, The Hidden Landscape, was named the Natural World Book of the Year. Um, since 1997, he's been a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, Life was shortlisted for the Rhone Poulenc Prize in 1998, and Trilobite, which you have to say like that because it's got an exclamation mark on the end, was shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize in 2001. He was Collier Professor of the Public Understanding of Science and Technology uh, of, at the Institute of Advanced Studies in 2002. He's won the Lewis Thomas Prize of Science Writing uh, in 2003 and also holds um, the Royal Society's Michael Faraday Prize for Public Communication of Science. He's also turned his pen to writing dinosaur poems for children and even a spoof book on the Rubik's Cube. Uh, probably less well known for that. Uh, Dr Forty has been elected President of the Royal Geological Society of London for its bicentennial year of 2007 and was recently awarded um, another honorary degree um, by the University of St Andrews. So ladies and gentlemen, very pleased to uh, uh, present Tracy Chevalier and Dr Richard Forty. <laughs> I 
I'd like to um, open this conversation by asking a very general question about Mary Anning's time um, and, in particular, um, what was going on in terms, of, in terms of thinking, what sort of environment um, she was emerging into? Uh, well, I've, it was a very important time for both science and society. Um, science, in particular, the geological sciences, were just coming, uh, coming of age. Geology is the youngest of the sciences. Um, and a lot of discoveries were made, for example, in the field of fossils, which demanded some interpretation. Particularly in Paris and in France, uh, at the same time, the idea of the succession of strata was becoming clarified. And as soon as you have a succession of strata, you introduce the concept or the possible concept of geological time. And rational people began to realise that that time had to be considerable. And all of this uh, had disquieting things, disquieting effects on wider society at the time. The time, we should say, is actually the early 19th century, um, to put it into context. Mary Anning lived between 1799 and 1847, and so we're talking about the late 18th century, early 19th century. And, and particularly the decade between about 1810 and 1820. Yeah, yeah. And up until that time, in the mid to late 18th century, there was the growth of the Industrial Revolution, which caused a lot of um, quarrying to take place. And so fossils had always been known. Hadn't, I mean, the Greeks had written about them. They were, had a long history, but nobody really knew what they were. And a, there were a lot of theories that they, were, um, they weren't uh, animals. They were actually thunderbolts, like these things called belemnites or long pencil-like things were thunderbolts or something that God threw down. Um, that's what made the noise when there was lightning. And um, ammonites, which are coiled... Um, they look a bit like snails. Uh, they, had, they were headless snakes, and they called them snake stones. So they were snakes. They were actually something that existed. But a lot of them were seen as, as things that, that were just strange structures of, of rocks. And, but there were more and more of them found with all of the quarrying that went on. And that was, I think, partly why there was this huge growth of, the, of geology at the time, of uh, the late 18th, early 19th century. It also became fashionable to have, if you were a gentleman, to have yes. a collection of your own, a collection of curiosities. Yes, we know how to show like off to, to your friend, don't they? <laughs> but it wasn't all positive, was it? I mean, there was some very yeah. negative around at the time, and, and some people were particularly worried about what was being discovered. Why were they so? Why were they so concerned about it? Well, most people at that time, it was a very religious society, which we tend to forget um, because we're so a-religious um, for the most part. But at that time, uh, most people were Church of England. Um, most people went to church read the Bible, and believed that the Bible was a historical record of the world. And um, most people, even people who went to Oxford, Cambridge, were trained as scientists, often trained as vicars as well. And there was this mixing of religion and science. And uh, the, the world was seen as very young, or, or young to us. It was 6,000 years old. And in fact, there was a bishop named Bishop Usher from Northern Ireland, who in the 17th century did this very scholarly calculation of, with the Bible, counting up all of the begats and all of the hundreds of years that everybody lived, and added it all up and said, okay, the world was created on October 23rd, 4004 BC. So we've got an anniversary coming up. I hope you celebrate it. <laughs> and uh, in the King James Bible that you'd have in every church that everybody looked at, um, there was, uh, uh, there was the, the words of the Bible, and then they'd have all of the dates in red on the left-hand side that would say, here's when, in Genesis, here's all the dates, here's all the... And, and uh, so you could follow along all of his scholarship. And this was seen as brilliant scholarship. So most people, if we were all here, 1805, we would all think, you know, probably 99 of the 100 of us would think that the world was 6,000 years old. But at the same time, there was a community of savants, an international one, uh, particularly in France, uh, who had begun to question some of these assumptions. Yes. Um, the, probably the greatest comparative anatomist of all time, Baron Cuvier, for example, had recognised that there were such things as extinct, what he regarded as extinct species. And this immediately makes for questions about the literalness of the biblical account. At about the time Mary Anning 
was making her discoveries, there was still an idea abroad that if you looked in some remote corner of the world, the things in the rocks might still be living. And after all, the world was still not fully explored. So it was vaguely plausible. Yes, there was an assumption um, when she discovered the ichthyosaur. She and her brother found a complete specimen of an ichthyosaur. They thought it was a crocodile, but it had a huge bulbous eye and paddles, so it was nothing like a crocodile that we know. And um, there were suggestions that it was an animal that was living off the coast of South America um, because I guess that was far enough away from uh, Lyme Regis that they could think, well, it must be someplace we just don't know where it is. Um, so that was one explanation of it, is that there were still, that there was no, no such thing as extinction, that there were still animals. Because people uh, hated the idea of, of extinction. To them, it, 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 made, it suggested that God had made a mistake. Mm. Why would God br- bring an animal into being and then let it die out? That was just not part of the, the Bible's history. And so there was that, that was a challenge. But then... There was also the idea that you know the, the rocks were made on day four or day three, whatever, and the animals on day five and humans on day six, um, in, according to Genesis. And there's always this gnarly question of, well, if the animals, if the rocks are made on day four and the animals are made on day five, then how did the animals get inside the rock? And a lot of people, as fossils, a lot of people asked this question and couldn't answer it. So there was a great, great deal of worry that uh, they couldn't. The, the way that we were looking at the world really was going to have to change, and it was a huge challenge to the Church of England. It was a huge challenge to the Bible as history. It was asking people to look at the Bible as metaphor instead, and that was a, a big leap to take. And I think people weren't prepared for it. But having said that, I mean the the people like uh, Buckland, the intelligentsia, uh, were very very Daniel interested was the first in professor of geology at Oxford. Yeah. Uh, they were, they were very interested in the scientific importance of these animals. They recognised that this was something they had to deal with. And Buckland yes. was a religious man. And Buckland was a reverend, yes. Yeah. And, of course, quite famously, he looked in the rock record for support for the biblical flood for a while, an idea he subsequently outgrew. Uh, so, but this is all indicative of this kind of uh, um, worry about literal truth biblical truth and time. Uh, And that was all coming to a head just at the time this novel begins. Yes, and in the middle of it all was a working class girl who lived in Lyme Regis who needed, who who had the eye. She could find things easily on the beach and she sold fossils for a living and she found amazing discoveries and was completely self-taught. So she was kind of thrown into the mix of this anxiety and there she was just making a living. I think having the eye is something which obviously features in both your writing a lot. I mean, in terms yeah. of, of Mary Anning having this, almost what we might consider a gift uh, for finding fossils. And, um, Richard, you, you talk about um, the joy of discovery as well. And, um, Tracy, yeah. you talk about bolts of lightning in your book. Well, um, one of the things that drew me to Mary Anning to begin with, apart from the amazing things she found, was that she was struck by lightning as a baby and, um, and survived it. And I decided, as a novelist, that was just a gift to me. So I decided to start off the novel that way. And in fact, I'm just going to read the first two pages of the book to you. Um, uh, because it's also, I, I thought I could also use it as a metaphor for, um, for, for finding things, for being struck by that joy of discovery, of, of finding treasure on the beach. Now, I can't do a Dorset accent or even an English accent to save my life. So you're just going to have to imagine it and just hear that barking American accent and just put it out of your mind. Lightning has struck me all my life. Just once was it real. I shouldn't remember it, for I was little more than a baby. But I do remember. I was in a field where there were horses and riders performing tricks. Then a storm blew in, and a woman picked me up and brought me under a tree. As she held me tight, I looked up and saw the pattern of black leaves against a white sky. Then there was a noise, like all the trees falling down round me, and a bright, bright light, which was like looking at the sun, a buzz run right through me. It was as if I'd touched a hot coal, and I could smell singed flesh, and sense there was pain, yet it weren't painful. I felt like a stocking turned inside out. Others begun pulling at me and calling, but I couldn't make a sound. I was carried somewhere. Then there was warmth all around, not a blanket, but wet. 
It was water, and I knew water. Our house was close to the sea. I could see it from our windows. Then I opened my eyes, and it feels like they haven't been shut since. The lightning killed the woman holding me and two girls standing next to her, but I survived. They say I was a quiet, sickly child before the storm, but after it, I grew up lively and alert. I cannot say if they're right, but the memory of that lightning still runs through me like a shiver. It marks powerful moments of my life, seeing the first crocodile skull my brother found and finding its body myself, discovering my other monsters on the beach. Other times, I'll feel the lightning strike and wonder why it's come. Sometimes I don't understand, but accept what the lightning tells me, for the lightning is me. It entered me when I was a baby and never left. I feel an echo of the lightning each time I find a fossil, a little jolt that says, yes, Mary Anning, you are different from all the rocks on the beach. That is why I'm a hunter, to feel that bolt of lightning and that difference every day. Oh, I was struck when I read that by how similar it was to my attempt to describe the special feeling you get as a paleontologist, and the paleontologist here will agree with me, I'm sure, when you actually make a new discovery. And I, this was a, an account of my first trilobite, my first important discovery to myself. And uh, here, this is me talking, uh, perhaps when I was 16. Uh, the trilobite had the shape and feel of an artifact, something of the neatness and symmetry of a medallion. Like a medallion, it could sit comfortably in the palm of my hand. The fossil showed a head with its eyes and a middle lobe, a tail, and a thorax with perhaps a dozen segments, a complicated animal despite its antiquity. I remember a curious feeling as if in some way this revelation to my hammer after so long a sleep in the bedding of the rock had not just been a matter of serendipity. Perhaps I had been intended to find that trilobite, to make the blow upon just that piece of rock, and to release that very messenger from the past into the world to tell its story. I became aware of the continuity of things. There was a thread running between this trilobite and this investigator. At the time, the only feeling I would have been able to articulate was one of specialness, of the moment and of the place, a kind of contentment I could hug to myself. The excitement of the find was physical, like any kind of hunting, but the metaphysical component was there too, at the very least, a species of shock to be made so aware of how long this place had existed as a haven for life. Why else should this stone bug, reserved, preserved in fossil clay in part and counterpart, have seemed as if sent to me as a talisman? Now, I think you'll agree there's an extraordinary kind of, even in the sense of shock, similarity between those two accounts, which, of course, led me to ask myself uh, whether you yourself had this kind of... Uh, uh, longing to find things, this desire well, to find things. I do, um, I do have this tendency um, to find four-leaf clovers when, when the rest of my family don't. Um, and uh, my husband reminded me recently that when we were first seeing each other, we were walking across a field, and I didn't even stop. I just swooped down, picked it, picked it up, and handed it to him, a four-leaf clover. And there's just something about it. I can find them very easily. Um, it's something to do with pattern recognition or um, just seeing a lot of threes and then suddenly the, the four is there. And I, um, I love going out on, on the beach. I mean, I, I'm not trained as a scientist, and so when I was first interested in Mary Anning, I was a little bit intimidated by the science. And, um, but once I started going out on the beach, it felt uh, looking for fossils myself because I always want to do the research. I need to do the thing that my character is doing. Once I started going out, I, I felt like I got my eyes in, I got, I, I, I got it, and I'd get that kind of jolt. I mean, it wasn't exactly lightning, but there is something when you see it, and it's different from everything else. It really, um, it really makes you feel like you're connected to the world, and, and that, that's something that's so old, and I'm so annoyed because I left two of my best finds upstairs in my bag, um, so maybe afterwards I'll get them and bring them over. Um, but they, I still can't let go of them when I find, when I have them, I, I hold them. As you were saying in, in what you read, like holding it in your hand, there's just something that you just feel incredibly connected to this creature from the past. And, um, and it's, it's not something romantic. It's not sentimental. It's actually kind of anti-sentimental. It's really kind of basic rock feeling. And um, I, 
I love that, and I feel like okay, I've read, I've written the book now, and I suppose I could never go out on the beach. But I was out on the beach at Lyme Regis yesterday and looking for things, and and found myself. Um, I, I getting into it takes a while, but you get into this sense of I don't know if it takes you a while to start finding things, but you you have to give yourself you slow down, you start looking more carefully, and you feel really connected. And it's a it's a wonderful feeling, and I'm sure I'll be doing it all my life. Well, well, certainly the thrill of discovery is something yeah. that uh, it, it's at a, it's at most visceral of just finding a fossil or making that kind of discovery. It's not there one moment, the next minute, yeah. the rock is split, and there it is, you know, and you've found yeah. it. So that's an extraordinarily sort of simple thing in a way. But I think for scientists it also connects onwards to the idea of making a discovery about the physical world, for example. I mean, it might fit into all that's gone on before how does in it terms fit of into scientific the, discovery. How does it fit into the pattern of life? Right. Uh, how does it fit to what's into what's known before and what's yet to be discovered? Um, so uh, as, a, as a scientist develops... Um, they're more able, I think, to both find the things and fit them into the larger pattern, which is not actually so very different in a sense from you discovering a character and fitting it, fitting it into a novel. Yeah, I suppose. It takes a, a certain um, ability to discriminate between... You, you have a whole lot of information and you have to figure out what works and what, what doesn't work. And, and it, there is a kind of uh, taxonomy in a, in a certain way. I mean, I guess the kind of research I do that I... I use probably about one tenth of the research that I, I I read a lot more. I do a lot more, and maybe I use a tenth of it in the novel. And the rest of it has to, you know, you can find out amazing details, but if they don't fit the narrative or what you're trying to do, then you just have to leave them aside. So it's, I suppose it's like um, scientific. Uh, I don't know. Can you let go of a trial about if you find it? If it's not good enough, do you put it back? Well, the, the, there is a golden rule. You never throw anything away. Right. So um, where is that stuff now? It's in your office. This is extremely embarrassing for me now because I have an office that I've been in for more than 30 years. And uh, uh, the problem is going to be finding my way through all the stuff that's accumulated there. Uh, but um, let's t go back to this idea of discrimination. Uh, I mean, when you... Mary Anning was able to discriminate between different species of giant reptile and, indeed, yeah. bet between different species of ammonite. So yes. she was doing uh, uh, taxonomy, in Which a sense. Which was pretty surprising, given that she had no formal education at all. She learned to read and write in Sunday school, but she didn't have any, um, even any schooling in a school, much less any scientific uh, learning. Uh, so a naturalist or a, a taxonomist... Uh, looking at the natural world, is trained up and becomes skilled in making fine discriminations. Um, I, I have one or two uh, good friends who are, uh, who are not um, botanically skilled, so they divide the, world, the, botanic, the botanical world into sort of trees, grass and flowers. Uh, sounds greater good. Knowledge, <laughs> <laughs> sounds good to me. <laughs> greater knowledge, of course, makes you much more aware of distinctions. And that, it seems to me that choosing or recognising characters and characteristics of animals and plants or fossils is not actually so very different or not fundamentally different from the kind of choices that you might make as a novelist in yeah. developing themes, characters or metaphors. Especially if you're having, having to sift through such an enormous amount of research. I mean, do, yes. do you have a real sort of feeling? Do you, have, do you get a bolt of lightning when you find a fact yeah. that you, you, you know, do you yeah. have a real sense of its importance? Yeah, but I, sometimes I get, I find something out and just think, this is incredible, um, and then I can't use it. I found out that um, Jane Austen was, uh, went to stay in Lyme Regis, and she actually met Mary Anning's father, because he was a cabinet maker, um, apart from hunting, hunting for fossils, and she took a little um, chest, a traveling chest in to have the lid fixed, and she, wanted, she got a quote from him, and he quoted way too high for her, um, which she wrote to her sister afterwards and said, um, I'm, you know, I'm not going not gonna to take my business to him. And I thought, oh, this is fantastic. Mary, you know, Jane, I could put Jane Austen in the novel, and then I just, it just didn't work. It just, I, I would just be shoehorning it into a scene and, or scenes or just fixing the, putting the book around that. And I thought, no. So I put it in the acknowledgments. In the afterward, I said, yes, yeah, by the way. But, um, <laughs> but I just didn't want, um, I didn't want it to be, you kind of know when it works and when it doesn't. And then on the other hand, there was a, I had a lightning bolt of, of research when I was, I was at the Natural History Museum 
And um, they have a kind of cache of, of Mary Anning stuff, uh, letters and a, a notebook of bits and pieces of stuff she wrote down. Mostly, it, not, it's not a diary, and it's more like she wrote down bits of poetry, things that she read from uh, newspapers and things, and uh, mostly religious stuff. But she also copied out scientific papers. At the time, she would not have been able to, to belong to the Geological Society or the Royal Society or any place that, uh, that, had, that published journals. She couldn't have afforded to buy them or wouldn't have been allowed to buy them. And, uh, but people would lend her scientific papers. And um, one of the guys, men she knew, William Conybear, was writing on, I can't remember what it was he was writing on, but in 1822 he published something. It wasn't an ichthyosaur paper, it was something else. And she must have come out, she'd go out all day fossil hunting, and she came back at night and wrote out, it must have taken days, this 22-page thing, very long, um, with several prefaces the, book, the, the paper had. And I, I didn't read through all of it, I skimmed it, and I, at the very end, the last page of it, she wrote at the bottom in, of it, when I write a paper, there will be but one preface. <laughs> and I was just, ah! Oh! It was, I had, I had read a lot about Mary Anning that other people had written, and as far as I could see, nobody else had mentioned this little thing that she had written, and to me, it just, it was the key to her character. She was at the point where she was, uh, two things. First of all, she was thinking, I'm going to write a paper. Yeah. You know, I know enough now. I could write a paper. And I just thought it was wonderful that she felt that. And the other thing was that she felt, she felt confident enough to criticize another scientist, say, I'm he's way too long-winded, going on way too much. I just have one preface. And I, I was wondering, unfortunately, she never did write a paper. But I was, it, it was enough for me. It was like that key where you just look at it and think, oh, this is gold. <clears throat> Yeah, I couldn't. I was trying when I read that. I was trying to remember when female writers had appeared on scientific papers, uh, but it wasn't for some years. Oh, no. uh, so the actual scientific description, shall we say, of these fossils was regarded very much as a male province, yes. which makes her determination really uh, to make a mark in the field all the more extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. But what also struck me, because, uh, of course, your, the narrative of your book does follow the, the facts quite closely. More or less, yes. Yeah. Was that um, uh, not, the males were not the enemy. Uh, some of them actually helped her in very material ways, like, yes. for example, the famous auction. Yes. yes. Uh, which helped them out of a, tr a terrible, the Annings out of a terrible financial hole. And at least as you describe it, uh, Buckland, whom we've mentioned already, mm -hmm. uh, was prepared to treat her as some sort of, well, at least sub-equal. When, when Mary had found the... Yeah, when Mary had discovered the ichthyosaur, um, met, scientific men started coming down to Lyme Regis because they wanted their own, and, or they wanted, they wanted to build their fossil collections. And they either bought things from Mary or they got her to take them out fossil hunting. And um, there were all kinds... Probably all a parade of very famous scientists, William Buckland, William Conybear. Charles Lyle ended up down there, Gideon Mantell, Richard Owen. And some of them said nice things about her, and some of them called her prim, vinegar, mannish, never, she'll never get husband kind of comments. And, um, but yes, they were very helpful to her financially in some ways, um, but they also ignored her. So they would go, they'd get what they want, and they'd pay her, and then they'd go off, and she would be left high and dry without... And she, she wrote this plaintive letter to one of the... the to, um, Roderick Murchison's uh, wife in 1829 saying, I, um, please tell me what's going on I, uh, in the scientific world. I haven't heard from anybody in over a year. I know as much about what's going on as the man on the moon in terms of science. And it, it made you realize that she was, they, they used her for what they wanted and yeah. then they would go off and she, she, couldn't, she couldn't go to London. She didn't have the money. She couldn't uh, take the uh, buy the journals or be be a member. Of, so she was kept at a distance. She was not alone in this, though. I mean, for example, Murchison, Sir Roderick Murchison, whom you mentioned, yeah. was a grandee, an aristocrat, and in common with people at the time, he thought he could simply acquire other people's knowledge. He made a rather grand progress, famous progress through Wales, staying with a lot of uh, educated country vicars on the way, mm -hmm. uh, and simply acquiring their information with rather right. cursory acknowledgement. Right. So did, within that system, actually the, yeah, possession yeah. of specimens 
could yes. have been regarded as almost uh, um, your right by birth. And actually owning the specimen was regarded probably as rather more important than finding, than finding the it, specimen. Yeah. Well, I think Mary was seen as a, um, as a servant, really, a handmaiden. You know, she found the thing, but once you bought it, that, you put your name on it. And it was the owner who put their name on it. And that was, you know, it's partly because she was working class, partly because she was a woman. It was a, a bit of both. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, from, from what she raised at the washroom of, that, of the copied out paper, she obviously thought of herself as a scientist. Yes. I mean, that took a while. That happened in 1822. Mind you, she was 23 by then. So mm. that's, that's so uh, she was getting, um, but she had become quite well known by then. So I think she was confident. And in a way, it's a very telling that she would be 23 because it's that kind of confidence of youth. Of, of, uh, you, you've established yourself, but you're still quite young and you, you think you haven't been ground down by all the no's in life quite yet, and that happened to her later on. So she became much more bitter uh, later in her life. I wanted to ask you why, having, you know, have this amazing access to all of this research and only being able to use a small part of it and the important bits of it, um, but why did you decide to write a novel rather than a biography? It's much more fun. It's much more <laughs> fun making things up. Um, I... I I appreciate all of the facts, and I use the facts as a kind of skeleton uh, and a, that sets boundaries for a book. But the flesh, which is the fiction that I put on, they, they kind of marry, and, and I, I, um, I love that bit. I feel like I can maybe say things that um, I couldn't otherwise. A biography is too much full of might have done, could have done, would have done, did she do this? Oh, I could, you know, and, and particularly with Mary Anning, I mean, she, she, there isn't that much known. She didn't write that much. You should, there are some letters, but there's not all that much. And, but more importantly, I feel like I can play with it. I can, there's, there's more room for me to um, work out what is important about, uh, about her story and, and, and give it to you and give it to, to people in a w way that is palatable and... Um, not just that it's not dry, but it gives it. It sort of makes. I try to make connections to to our world in a way that a, maybe a biographer wouldn't be able to so much. And in some ways, maybe I can get at at what we're concerned with more than a biographer might be able to. Do you ever feel constrained by the facts? Do you ever feel kind of sometimes? Yes, mm. yes. I mean, like with Mary Anning's life, she spent year after year. Uh, combing the beaches every day. And it's very hard to make a novel out of that. And there were moments in her life that were hugely dramatic. And where they occur um, is not necessarily in the best place for a novel. And so, because um, I couldn't write about all those long, long days of hunting. You would get bored, nobody would want to read it. I think that's true of uh, the biographies of scientists too. <laughs> uh, you know, yet another day in the lab. <laughs> Uh, uh, more barnacles. Doesn't, more barnacles, <laughs> yeah. Uh, does yeah. not necessarily make for dramatic yeah. reading. But it's yeah. interesting to think, isn't it, about the difference between the kind of uh, truth that you can get at in a novel and the kind of truth, scientific truth that scientists are supposed to deal with. Well, do you feel constrained by what you can't say, what you can't speculate, that you, the fact that you have to stick to the facts? Well... Um, I mean, you've written fiction I've, I yourself, don't think so. we have to stick necessarily entirely to the facts. <laughs> Um, but the, the, the facts, wow. of, the, the facts of, of the the fossils are there. I mean, Mary Anning's specimens are still there. Yeah. And the, the important thing about the past is that it's never fully made. People go back and re-examine the same fossils and come to different conclusions. They look at the same fossils maybe with a new technique. I mean, for example, people have been using CAT scans on fossils and just in the last few years. That wasn't available before. And so even old fossils can have a new life. Um, I don't know specifically about ichthyosaurs, but I mean the famous first bird, Archaeopteryx, for example, which is, if you know, people have to name one fossil, that's the one they've heard of, uh, has been repeatedly re been restudied and has come up with new truths. Say that recently the interior of the brain case has been modelled, for example. Uh, and actually you can hold it in your hand. It's been produced by a very clever technique uh, and tells us more about where this animal lived in relation to dinosaurs and birds, which, of course, is not an entirely new idea, but now 
fleshed out, literally, by enormous numbers of new discoveries. So fossils aren't simply things that sort of sit there when they've been found and never have another life. The truth is always moving onwards. That's scientific truth. But, even but if it embraces scientific... the old specimens as well. But even if that scientific truth is advancing and, and changing and interpretations change, it is always linked back to the evidence, isn't it? There's, n- it, there's never a point at which it leaps away from the evidence and, and gets a life of its own. Um, I can think of one or two scientists who probably do that. <laughs> but, of course, it doesn't, ap- it doesn't apply to me, I hasten to add. Except but, you have written fiction, haven't you? But I would, I would say also that, that on the subject of what, he, what is the true, uh, what can be described as truth, I mean, the novelist's truth has a kind of separate validity in a way. For example, you, mentioned, you read in your introduction about the lightning bolt that struck Mary Anning. You were right. I mean, that's obviously a tremendously significant event, would have been for anybody's life. And you, I think, rather cleverly kind of get inside her skull and make this part of her way of looking at the world. Uh, And I think, at least to me as a reader, and I'm sure those of you here who read the book would share that thought, it seems somehow true. Uh, But a scientist would see that, would take that same detail and make nothing of it. Yes, absolutely. I mean, a biographer could take it, but a scientist would just talk about what Mary discovered and, and couldn't say she discovered it because she was struck by lightning as a baby. It just doesn't makes no sense whatsoever. And in a way, I'm not suggesting she could find things because she was struck by lightning, but it, it's, the, it's, the, it's that joy of discovery, the jolt that, um, that started there. That doesn't mean she... But, you know, it, it, I, can, I can play with it as a metaphor in a way that a scientist never could. But then Richard read out something earlier when you were talking about finding trilobites, when you said it felt like you were meant to find it. You know, this is something which is actually very unscientific, but it tells us a lot about how it felt. Well, people, the trouble with people's, uh, not nobody here, but the trouble with there is a perception (laughs) of scientists uh, rather like that, um, the the geeky character in The Simpsons, you know, uh, and uh, as if they're not quite subject to the, the full panoply of human emotions that <laughs> m- many other professions have. I mean, this is complete baloney. Most scientists are ex- incremely, extremely emotional about what they do, uh, and um, uh, human foibles have a great deal, uh, have an important part to play in the story of scientific progress. Uh, I, d- I think this is absolutely as it should be, of course. Uh, what, that, that scientists are passionate and yeah. about what they, yeah. And sometimes novelists have even attempted to tackle what it is to be a scientist, but not enough. There is a, there is a huge difference in public perception, isn't there? I mean, we're talking generally, again, present company accepted. Um, that I would imagine if you ask most people what was more glamorous, a novelist or a scientist, they would say a novelist. Yes, they probably would. But I think that's partly because um, people... I think everybody is encouraged to write, to express themselves. And, you know, you always hear everybody has a novel in them if they want, and they could write it. And, and a, a novelist is just somebody who has done. But it's very easy for you to make a connection with me because you tell stories, everybody tells stories, and so you know what I do. And whereas a scientist has to have an incredible... Spe- it's hard being a scientist. You have to have very specialist knowledge... You have to. It's a. It's very. Um, you have to have a very systematic mind, and I think a lot of people who have not been trained that way just find it too scary. Um, whereas a novelist is much more approachable because it seems like other people seem think, oh, I could do that. I could do that if I put my mind to it. Whereas I couldn't be a rocket scientist. I wouldn't know how to do it. There is that. So that it seems. So instead of actually trying to engage with a scientist, I'm just going to push them and say, oh, they're geeky. They're nerdy. They all wear glasses, they all wear white lab coats, so, you know, whereas a novelist can be all glamorous. And it's silly, it's silly, but I think it's to do with fear, more fear of the, of, of the work that has to be done. Well, I, th- I mean, it is, I think it's true that one of the problems, particularly with science and education, is the rewards of science come after quite a long time, and a lot of that long time is quite hard work. Um, by the time you've arrived, say... Uh, uh, the state of, doing, the state of doing your PhD thesis, you're really beginning to have fun. But it's taken you a long, a long time to get there. 
Oh, and it requires a certain measure of dedication. There are plenty of novelists who are struggling and trying. It, they only achieve success after a long, long haul. Well, so we were saying, not, when we were sitting upstairs, you were saying uh, if uh, the difference is that if uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, say, was seen dry, driving a Prius, everybody would think it was cool. But if uh, a leading climate scientist was seen doing it, they'd think it was a bit geeky. Yeah, yeah it's silly. It, does, it shouldn't be like that, but it seems to be at the moment. Do you, think yeah. there's been, do you think there's more of a separation between the arts and the sciences now than there was in the early 19th century? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think in the early 19th century... Well, the first thing to say is that by about 1830, geology and paleontology was incredibly glamorous. Uh, when Murchison, I think it was, gave a lecture, uh, an open-air lecture... Um, in uh, Dudley, uh, there was a crowd of thousands of people to hear him. So, you know, he was very groovy indeed, to use an yes. entirely <laughs> ungroovy word. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think if you look at the quality of, of writing of the scientists, too, in the early 19th century, some of them were very good writers. Yeah. People dis differ in their opinion about Darwin as a writer, for example. Personally, I think he wrote very well. Um, and um, so I don't think there was this... I don't think the two-cultures thing was there at all nearly so strongly. Remember, the term scientist was only coined as a word in 1833. Uh, yes. yes, I found that out and had to sort of write all around it. Very hard. It's a word that's so used so much now, and you discover that you can't use it. It's very hard. Yes. Learned men, I think I said. But, but geologist was around yeah. Yeah, no, it's already in, in the yes. uh, early 1800s because the Geological Society, which you meant, of course, was, was founded in 1807, yeah. being the first of its kind anywhere. So geology is older than science itself. In that Interesting. very <laughs> narrow sense. <laughs> but chemistry had been around a lot longer before that. I've asked a lot of questions, um, and I expect that there are people out there with... with burning questions that they would like to ask Tracy and Richard, so do put your hands up gentlemen here at the front Tracy, um, you have mentioned Elizabeth Philpott yet, and yet she's yeah. central to the role in the book um, she is. particularly the role of the Philpott Um, in case you haven't heard in the back, the, the uh, Remarkable Creatures is actually about two women, Mary Anning and Elizabeth Philpot, who is a middle class spinster who moved from London to Lyme and became very good friends with Mary Anning, um, equally obsessed with fossils, but she didn't have to sell them for a living. Um, she could just collect them, she could hunt them and then keep them in her collection. She became passionate about fossil fish and uh, has a gorgeous collection of them, um, which sounds really boring, but actually they're not. They are glorious. I've seen them because they're at the Oxford University Natural History Museum collection. And um, I brought in Elizabeth into the story because I wanted, um, I wanted a different perspective on Mary Anning and on fossils as well. Mary, uh, working class, gonna have to have, she was going to have to have a, a limited perspective. She lived in Lyme all her life. She had no idea of the outer world, really. And Elizabeth could come in and, and have that, that vision, a, a broader vision. She could put into context um, the, the notion of what fossils might do to people's religious beliefs. Um, and also, uh, she was, I found their friendship so unusual because, first of all, there's a 20-age year gap. Elizabeth was 20 years older than Mary. But more importantly, there's a huge class gap at that gulf between them of a middle-class woman and a working class girl who really could have been her servant as easily as a friend, to, for her to become friends with her just seemed incredible. And um, I thought that that must have been some source of strength for Mary in her difficulties. And so that's what the book becomes about. It's as much about this friendship as it is about the fossils themselves. So Elizabeth has a very different perspective. And, and together, it also gives you an, a, a sense as a reader a, a way to look at Mary's genius. It's like you have to look at genius at work not from the genius's eyes, but actually from somebody standing back watching her, and that's what Elizabeth does. She also served in the plot of the book as an extremely useful conduit between the two levels of society. Yes, yes she, could, she could socialize and talk to the middle-class men in a way that Mary couldn't. Nor so. did, but, she, 
but she too did not publish scientifically on no. her no, collection. No, she was uh, not supposed to go into the Geological Society ha um, meetings, um, and so she was she had to stand out in the corridor to listen, um, which was also illegal. She probably shouldn't have done that, but she does it in the book anyway. Okay. There was actually something I wanted to ask about the book, which was that there's a part in it where Elizabeth gazes up to London to basically fight for Mary Anning's good name yes. when Cuvier is saying possibly this, well, this dinosaur... people haven't read it, so we don't want to give too much away, Ooh. do we? Maybe ask me after. I'll ask you after. Any... <laughs> we got that one. Any other questions out there? Yes. Do you I wait for... There's a microphone the coming around. Sorry. I would like to know how profitable uh, fossil collection was in, in the early 19th century. I, I mean, um, were you able to, to make a living out of that activity? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, Mary Anning did make a living, and her family made a living. It yeah. was rather a precarious one. Tracy may remember how much the star, how many pounds the star... The first, the first ichthyosaur was sold to, for 23 pounds. To that was the, a lot of money To the in those lord days. of the manor of Lyme Regis. And actually, we think that he, it was found on his property, so he may have demanded that she sell it to him. Um, but he then sold it on for much more to somebody in London. Mostly she had to make her living from selling ammonites for small sums. Yeah, uh, but because the, you could go a couple of years without finding any, any big, big creatures. So yeah, it's it was a, a lot of bitty stuff. But it, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting to reflect that the, that the value, the monetary value of these fossils has continued to be pretty high. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the famous spe a famous specimen of Tyrannosaurus rex, you know, the world's most famous... Uh, and familiar dinosaur was sold, I think, for six million dollars. Sue, is that right? Something like that. Uh, and uh, there's a, a one apparently that's doing the rounds now that may go for even more. Uh, so there is a, there has been a hefty and there are... value attached to to the most spectacular fossils. As far as people in the trade like me are concerned, it's slightly unfortunate. I mean, trilobites uh, are wonderful things but they used not to be expensive things. Uh, now, particularly ones that are mined from Morocco, uh, are making serious dents on the exchequer. So if there's anybody here who'd like to donate, donate very important specimens to the Natural History Museum. There are still fossil hunters who live in Lyme and, and find ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, and they, they excavate them and they sell them to private collectors, and they go for tens of thousands. If it's a good specimen, they get a lot. And I know there are a couple who make a living off of this. So, yeah, it still goes on. And is there anything in law about uh, who these things belong to? I mean, it sounds as though they just belong to whoever well, if, finds them. If you find a big specimen um, down at Lyme, you have to register it with a, a branch of the local government that, that, that you found it, but you can keep it. Right. Yeah, there, there's no... Treasure trove, in the strict sense, doesn't apply to fossil discoveries, which is actually rather unfortunate. There are certain laws that govern fossils leaving particular countries, uh, particularly scientifically important ones. For example, a type specimen, one on which a scientific name is based. Plenty of countries now have a, a, a rule that says you cannot export these. Uh, some still don't. Uh, but the, the law is much less uh, defined with regard to fossils than it is with regard to well, these wonderful artif human ar yeah. artefacts that have turned up recently. Yes. Which seems a little odd when they're going for such huge sums of money. Yes, it does. Mm. Yes. More questions? There's a lady at the front here. If you just wait for the raving microphone to appear by you. Thank you. Do you think the rhyme, she sells seashells by the seashore, has enhanced or belittled her reputation? <laughs> Um, if you didn't hear at the back, they, they're, there's a belief that the rhyme She Sells Seashells by the Seashore um, is attributed to Mary Anning. Uh, and, uh, and does this belittle her? Has it belittled her or enhanced her reputation? That's a good question. I, um, I think that it's an amusement that brings people to her. I don't think it's belittled her, really. Um, but I think most people don't realize it's about her. So it's, uh, uh, I'm not sure that it's gone that far to, to raising her reputation um, or, or diminishing it. Um, I did originally think I might 
uh, name the call the novel She Sells Seashells, but I just thought there's no way because I couldn't have to say that all the time and, <laughs> and uh, it sound drunk. And really, I don't want to be, appear to be drunk in, in public like that. So I, uh, I changed the, to a much better title anyway. But one of the things that, uh, I mean, that very little is known about what she looked like. There's just this one painting, isn't there? Unless yes. you know of others. No. And the, you, those of you who come to the Natural History Museum may uh, have noticed that there a young woman dressed up and pretending to be Mary Anning occasionally <laughs> wanders around uh, the galleries. And, uh, but she's always dressed in the same dress with the same basket yes. that appears in the same portrait. Yes, a um, bonnet, basket, green dress, yes. Very. But you had to dress her up through an entire novel in different ways, presumably. Of course, yes, yes. She had other dresses, not just the one. <laughs> It got quite muddy. Yes, very muddy. <laughs> There's a lot of mud in it. Any Another other question? questions? Yes, the gentleman down at the front here. Yeah, yeah you were talking about the, um, <coughs> the, the great art science divide and how science is perhaps viewed as less glamorous than the arts. How much do you think that is because artists are part of the marketplace? They have to sell themselves uh, to make a living. Um, and scientists are mostly. Uh, members of the employed bar, if one can put it that way. They're not, uh, they're not out there pleading their cases in front of the judge. They're just sit, sitting, uh, working away in the back office on the case. It's very important work. Um, and the test of that might be that most of, the sci- most of the living scientists who people can name, people on the street, tend to be authors. They are the great Stevens and the Richards, yourself and uh, Mr Dawkins. Um, and so they have sold themselves in the marketplace. They've produced something which perhaps isn't quite as glamorous as novel writing, but it certainly has a glamour to it and a controversy to it. Um, so it may simply be a matter of economics rather than um, anything else. I think you're else. absolutely right that, it's, that a lot of it... I mean, a, a lot of about being a novelist is now about promoting. And um, uh, at, for better or worse, some novelists love that part of it and then some really hate it and, uh, but have to do it. So it's... It's a tricky, whereas a scientist is usually employed by a, an institution. But I would have to say at this point that uh, most scientists have to sell themselves. Oh, before but committed. not because they not have to, the public, to write just research to the, just grants. To the, uh, yes. Just to the research grants. Just to keep yeah. going, you need to get your research grants. And plenty of scientists that I know, I'm, I'm rather, I've been rather lucky because I've been able to be a one-man band, or at least a one-and-a-half-man band, uh, <laughs> most of my life, and, uh, uh, but mo- a lot of corporate science these days requires the scientist who used to be hands-on and enjoy bashing the rocks or collecting the mollusk or whatever it happened to be, a lot of, large part of their life is spent writing research grants to tease reluctant funds out of overpressed government bodies like the Natural Environment Research Council. It's pretty hard stuff these days. To, to finance research. And a lot of scientists are now employed uh, on a kind of you have to raise your own salary and that of the people that work with you basis, which is really quite a tough call, I think. Not necessarily right either. Do you think that's particularly threatening to um, your own particular area of research and to areas of you know, taxonomy? Um, you know, that, that sort of wide approach to systematics. I mean, is that particularly threatened by um, oh, yes. Yes, the financial it is. situation? Definitely, because um, uh, it's much easier to get financed from, let's say, and just a wonderful job from, say, the Wellcome Foundation if you work upon mosquitoes or the vectors of human disease. Uh, if you work on uh, a, a little loved group of beetles for example, it's extremely hard to get funds. And gradually that has an insidious effect. It means that attention is shifted away from some parts of the animal kingdom, maybe, towards others. But all parts of the animal kingdom deserve our attention. Um, And uh, it's becoming harder to produce a kind of coverage of the natural world. So if this this situation where novelists are seen as more glamorous than scientists is partially produced by the financial situation and by artists having to promote themselves, scientists having to promote themselves to research councils rather than to the general public. How, how, do, we, how do we solve that? How do, we, how do we make you more glamorous, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> Not that, of course, it's possible. 
I refuse to answer that question <laughs> on the grounds that I might incriminate myself. <laughs> but thank you for the thought. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, seriously, the, uh, I think it's extraordinarily important that Britain maintains its lead, which it's had for many years, in systematic biology, in un understanding the diversity of the natural world. And it's never been more important than now when we're losing so much biodiversity. And what I would think, you know, damn my own glamour, if one could only uh, persuade more people of the importance of this kind of work, then that's what really matters. Um, and, uh, is that big for his next novel? Is that how I have to? That, yeah, you should have you. to do that for your next novel. Right. I'm sure. Yeah. That certainly sounds like something that scientists and novelists can work on together. Um, I'm now going to invite um, Anne Chisholm, who's the chair of the Royal Society of Literature, to come up and give a vote of thanks. Well, I am. Um... I realise I've missed a great opportunity this evening. I have had a fossil on my desk ever since I started writing my first biography. I walked out of the library at the University of Texas to find some latter-day Mary Anning selling little chips. It looked, like, looked to me like a chip of something in a pale, beigey, coloured stone with a shrimp-like thing on it. <laughs> and... and if I'd brought it here, I would at last know, 35 years later, what this was. Um, it gives me great pleasure to thank, on behalf of the Royal Society of Literature, not just our two speakers, but also Alice Roberts, for chairing so very cogently and humorously, and to say that we value very much this collaboration between the Royal Society of Literature and the Royal Society. It it does represent an attempt to link what I see they describe themselves as the um, country's leading science academy with the country's leading academy of literature. And for any of you who'd like to know more about the Royal Society of Literature, there are some membership brochures outside, and we welcome anybody to our monthly meetings um, at Somerset House. But... I think what always happens on these occasions is it's demonstrated that writers and scientists have more in common and can communicate more openly and agreeably and effectively than many of us might think. Something to do with the search for the significant detail and recognising the importance of clarity of observation and brilliance of expression. And I think both Richard Forte and Tracy Chevalier do that in their work. And we're all immensely grateful to them for talking to us this evening. Thank you.